Good afternoon, Your Honors. Uh, Robert Thompson on uh, behalf of the Commonwealth. Your Honors, in this case, with the jury returned a verdict against the defendant of armed assault with intent to murder and other charges, the defendant and the family exploded. The family, in, in particular, was shouting in anger at the, the jurors. The, uh, at that time, the court deemed the threat to the juror's safety is significant enough that he, he asked that they be escorted to their cars by police officers. Then two weeks later, and only after the defendant had been sentenced to 30 to 40 years, one of those family members who was in the courtroom that day came forward and said that <coughs> on the first day of trial, he heard someone he thought might be a juror say that the district attorney on the case was either the brother or the cousin of their boss. Does it matter that it was this person who brought this to the attention of the court? What if it was someone else? Your Honor, what I'm illustrating here is uh, it does matter because the person being shown, because the circumstances raise a danger to the jurors if the family members of the defendant uh, identify the jurors and, and now have gained access to them and have some kind of uh, post-conviction access that they could either intimidate or threaten or take revenge or any of those things. Yeah, but isn't that, isn't, and isn't that a question that the judge considered and concluded that there was a sufficient basis here that they ought to proceed down this next step? Why isn't no, that? No, Your Honor, what I'm suggesting is that two things. One, first of all, as this court uh, fairly recently announced in, well not announced, but observed in Commonwealth versus Silver, which is at 448 Mass 701, particularly 708, that the s safety of the jurors is crucial to the functioning of our, of our entire judicial system, and that the justice system owes the jurors the highest degree of vigilance for their protection. And in this situation, where it is not at all clear, and I would say as a matter of law, not sufficient, showing that any inquiry is warranted, and the judge himself expressed doubts about whether any inquiry is warranted, then this procedure that allows some degree of risk that th these jurors will be able to be identified through this procedure is entirely unwarranted and amounts to abuse of discretion. At the very least, there needs to be a determination that if true that this was a juror, then there would have to be, there would be enough to be an inquiry. And here, I would suggest as a matter of law, there is not. Well, are we looking at what the trial judge ruled or yes, we are. what the single justice ruled? Both, Your Honor. Both, Your Honor. If the trial judge, if the trial judge uh, abused his discretion by um, risking unwarranted, creating an unwarranted risk to the safety of the jurors, then presented with the same arguments, the single justice essentially did the same thing. But the single justice can decline to hear it simply because it doesn't present an extraordinary matter. But it does present an extraordinary matter because of the risk of safety to the jurors, Your Honor. It's not a matter. We're not here talking about the, the sanctity of the, of the verdict here. We're talking about the safety of the jurors. That's why the Commonwealth is here today. But help me understand how the jurors' safety was endangered by this procedure. This was, the procedure was that the investigator for the defense counsel could get, get photographs of the jurors from the Registry of Motor Vehicles, correct? Yes, correct. And could show these photographs without the names on them to this witness, correct? Yes, sir. And that was it. So to tell me what the process is by which the, the doing that would endanger the jurors unless we assume that the CPCS attorney or the investigator is going to furnish the names to the I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the process the is by which the, the jurors are endangered. The names are didact or didacted. Redacted. 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 Yes, Your Honor. The names are, uh, so under the judge's orders, the names are not supposed to be, not supposed to be on the, the pictures. What is allowed is a showing of a single picture um, in isolation, identifying that essentially identifies that person in the picture as one of the jurors. It is certainly a piece of information that uh, could be used to, to try to, to determine who that juror is. It allows too many slips. That's the secondary argument of the Commonwealth in here, is that the procedure allowed by the judge is far too, too lax. It allows too many possibilities of error. Certainly, take it a step further, Your Honor, if this 
was uh, gets to the next step and did allow for an inquiry of the juror. By now, by now, the the, per, we the haven't, person showing Mr. Thompson, up in court. We haven't, we haven't got there. So you're showing a photograph with all identifying information redacted, correct? That's all that's happening. We're showing a photograph in an uncontrolled situation well, you, that is I, identifying I thought, the person as a juror. It's not an uncontrolled situation. I thought the Commonwealth was going to be pleasant. Without any uh, veto power or any ability well, veto to power of with, what? Uh, the, the possibility that it's too lax, that it allows uh, too much identification. What do you For, mean it allows too much? There's a photograph with no identification, no, no information. The photograph allows the person to be recognized as a jury. It's just shown in a single thing. There's not a photo array requirement. That's one of the things we're suggesting, that a photo array should be required so that that piece of information, that this photograph is a juror, is not immediately conveyed to the, to the member of the defendant's family. That's one of the things we've said. I'm also trying to suggest that if this does go any further, now if it goes further, the the... Members of the defendant's family are noticed that people who show up and go into the court that room that day are indeed the jurors, and they can follow them, and they can check them, they can see them. It gives them a piece of information that can be used. But Mr. Mr. Uh, Thompson, when you have a jury, the, the people are sitting in the jury. This is, this is not there. They've been seen, Your Honor, if the defendant... Uh, could say that this was a, if the, not the defendant, but the affiant could say that this was a juror, if this was in fact a, a, uh, a accurate uh, assessment of what took on, then he would have been able to recognize him. Um, he has not. He said he was not, he doesn't know that this is a juror. Um, the point is, there is a degree of risk. I'm not, I have not said that, not claimed that it's a particularly high degree of risk. What I'm also saying, though, is when, as a matter of law, no inquiry to the jurors is warranted based on this limited information here, that the uh, district attorney may be the boss's... Uh, was. 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 The well, I assume, I assume the implication here is that the juror didn't disclose this when she or whoever, when they were asked, do you know the prosecutor? Do you exactly. Know and that, and oh, no, that, I don't know him, but she's my, he's what, my boss's brother? Or cousin. And that right. would not be within the scope of that question. There's no reason to, to, to indicate, to question the honesty of the juror if she didn't respond to the question, do you know the prosecutor? The answer under this information is quite accurately no. Then, then I don't know the, him, but I know that he's my boss's brother. But it doesn't, so then later, the juror is asked, is there any reason that you're aware of, anything in your life that you're aware of that would affect your partiality? And this juror says no. Assuming that it's a juror, this juror says no. There's no particular reason to question that, Your Honor. Uh, okay, so you're the prosecutor, and a juror doesn't disclose that the defense counsel is her boss's brother. All right, you're going to be okay with that. Your Honor, that's, that's the, it was not within the scope of the question. If anyone was going to try to challenge what happened at trial in a post-verdict thing, claiming that there was some kind of undisclosed bias in the case, then the case law is quite clear. In a post-verdict situation, they have to show that there was dishonesty in the response and that it would have amounted to a, to a basis for a challenge of cause. To even get an evidentiary hearing, there would need to be some kind of colorable showing that they would be able to satisfy that. There is not here. There is none of that here. There is not a dis any indication of a dishonest response. There is no real question to, to uh, question the juror's assertion of impartiality. If this had come up during a voir dire and the juror had said, I am nonetheless impartial, that would not be a basis for any kind of uh, challenge for cause, they would be entirely acceptable. Because we have no idea what this juror actually did answer to any questions because we don't know who it is. No, we know, we, we know that the jurors were selected, indicated they did not know the prosecutor, and indicated that they were impartial because those are asked to all the jurors, Your Honor, right. if it in fact is a juror. Your Honor, um, I, I, I'm just saying I don't know whether there were indi individual voir dire on this. In addition, I, I don't know. Sometimes Your there Honor, are sidebar part of the questions. Record, it's part of the record that they are asked those general questions that I've, that I've indicated to you. Um, Your Honor, my brother in his brief cites the case of Commonwealth versus Cousin, which is, uh, involves the question of whether there was 
the propriety of looking into jurors' records in the middle of a trial, the, that case quite clearly distinguishes the situation on possible bias of pre-verdict versus post-verdict. And in footnote, uh, I believe it's 20, at page 21, the, the case, the, the court makes it quite clear that the standards are quite different. And post-verdict, for any kind of indication of individual juror bias, you have to show both what I said, dishonesty and a basis for cause. Your Honor, in terms of general extraneous influence, the idea that other jurors would be influenced is too speculative to be held in there. Your Honor, we'd ask that you reverse both the trial judge and the single justice and and uh, as we requested in the brief. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Litt. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Uh, may it please the court. Uh, my name is John Redden. I represent uh, Terry Richardson. Uh, I represent him at trial as well. Um, it's clear under uh, this court's opinion in Fiddler and Dixon uh, that a defendant is entitled to do some preliminary investigation on his own. Uh, to see if there was uh, some type of impermissible extraneous influence on a juror. Uh, what's also clear under Fiddler and Dixon is what, a, what, what defense counsel may not do is initiate communication with the juror. Judge Locke, who was the trial judge here, his, his ruling uh, essentially does nothing more than allow the defendant to do that which is his right. And because it does nothing more than that, I suggest this is not a proper vehicle for 211.3 uh, review. Um, I'd just like to touch on a, tuple, a couple points. Uh, Mr. Thompson mentioned the issue of the photo array and where that leads him in terms of his argument. Um, and it's true Judge Locke did not actually endorse the order to say to the defense, do it by some type of photo array or serial presentation procedure. But it's clear uh, in, in his ruling and in his directions to me that he expects it to be done that way. And uh, I'm not in the habit of ignoring whatever a judge suggests to me, and especially not Judge Locke. Um, and to the extent I can get similarities, uh, which may have its own problems associated with it, I, I certainly intend to do uh, that which Judge Locke uh, suggests. So uh, this suggestion that uh, by uh, doing nothing more than what a defendant would have the right to do under Dixon and Fiddler uh, create some danger to the jurors, I, I, I suggest becomes an argument which is uh, more an emotional one than a um, uh, logical one. This, this case has carried a lot of emotions with it. Uh, the uh, uh, victim in this case was a, a Brockton uh, police officer. The courtroom was full of black Brockton police officers uh, day in and day out. Uh, and uh, I can understand the emotions on both sides, but from a logical perspective, uh, I, I, I don't think there's a basis in, in this record to say there's any realistic risk of danger to anyone. Uh, judge Locke, an experienced judge, former prosecutor, both in the state and the federal system, obviously didn't believe that was the case. Uh, he saw what happened in the courtroom. He, kno he, he knows what happened maybe better than any of us because his perspective was somewhat different than mine. Um, and uh, I, th I think his his... Uh, determination here is, should be given great deference. Um, um, the, the question about how, we can, how, if we assume as we must, based on the uh, Commonwealth's argument that this event did happen, where this re remark was made to uh, Richardson's brother, um, how that came up? How did the jury learn that the prosecutor trying the case was indeed uh, closely related to the? brother or cousin? Was it something she knew beforehand and didn't disclose? Or is it something that she learned after she got on the jury and there was some type of communication made to her? Because this, this uh, event happens, I believe, on June 4th, which is uh, the, the second day of trial. Uh, jury selection was on, uh, on, on the prior day, which I think was June 3rd. It, it strikes me uh, that uh, it, it, it's fair to infer that this juror engaged in some communications uh, between getting on the jury and, and, and that point in time on June 4th when she's overheard having this conversation. By the way, in the presence of another gentleman who I think is for certain a juror because of his rather distinctive uh, hairstyle, uh, as I mentioned in my affidavit, uh, it, it seems to me it's fair to infer that she had communications after she became a juror 
Um, and those communications included something very significant about a party in the case that's outside of the record, i.e. that that party, the Commonwealth, is represented by somebody who has, has supervisory power over her. And it seems to me it, it, it's fair under these uh, circumstances to suggest and have a reasonable suspicion that that was not the limit of the communications to that juror. And, and I think if you look at our case law in terms of discussing uh, the standards for having a post-verdict of voir dire, that this clearly falls within it. In Fiddler uh, the, and in Dixon, the court used the language, some suggestion of extraneous influence. Dixon went on to talk about a colorable showing that the extraneous influence may have had an impact. Uh, and it says it must be something more than speculation. And in Solis and a number of other cases, uh, this court has repeatedly said uh, that a judge should be receptive to conducting an inquiry once the defendant establishes a basis for suspicion. Uh, I would suggest under all these circumstances that uh, uh, the trial judge, Judge Locke, acted well within his discretion and the single justice acted well within her discretion in denying the Commonwealth's petition. Uh, unless there are any further questions, I would rely on, on, on my brief. Thank you, Mr. Whitten. 